So I'm going to sit down and start this um, portion by talking about stories. I know that we've talked already multiple times through the Q&A about why stories are so important. Um, but I think you, know, you can hear it, and I, I want you all to believe it. I want you to believe that what we're saying is true, that while we're giving you lots of information that will hopefully be useful in your visits, that the most important thing you can provide in a visit is your story. So um, I'm going to make sure I'm looking at the right page. OK, so there are two reasons that stories are important. So first of all, we talked a little bit about numbers, right? They can be good, they can be bad. It depends on the context. I think we, we, we dove into some nuance there, right? Um, but what I really like to say is that members of Congress and their staff are faced with numbers, policy briefings, and statistics on pretty much a daily basis, right? Um, I forget who it was during uh, the last couple hours that said this, but we heard from the stage, sometimes the members of Congress in their offices, they already have the numbers, right? Um, and those numbers, if they haven't taken any action, clearly did not um, make the push that, that we needed it to, right? Constituent stories stand out because they bring to life those statistics or those um, issues that for some members might feel um, far away or, or, or they might feel detached from it, right? And they, stories, do this in a way that briefings and numbers really can't, okay? And at FCNL, we like to quote a study done by the Congressional Management Foundation that says telling your story directly to a legislative office in a lobby visit, whether it is in person or over the phone or on Zoom, the point is you're telling it directly, it actually has the most potential to influence um, that office than compared to, let's say, writing letters or, or even calling the office and leaving a message. Those things are important. We should be uh, doing those things as well. I like to say there are many roles in a social justice movement when we're advancing any policy, any issue. There are many roles that we need uh, filled. And we are here to be lobbyists, to fill that role of advocates who are talking to decision makers. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these staffers that were um, uh, you know, surveyed for, uh, by the Congressional Management Foundation said that directly telling a story is going to have the most potential to influence that office. And, and so let that sink in, internalize that, please. Um, and I also like to say that we are reminding them of the people at the end of their policy decisions, right? It's very easy for them uh, to be sitting in Congress in their, in their offices, at a desk with all these, all these papers, all these meetings, and, and forget that their decisions have a direct impact on thousands, millions of people. So the second reason that stories are so important is because constituents play a unique role in the policy making process. So member of Cong members of Congress do their best to be informed, okay? That, that they want to be uh, informed on all the issues that exist out there, but that's just impossible, right? We're all people, and they're also humans that have uh, limited brain space, and so they, they are not able to remember every single thing about every issue. None of us can, right? And so that's where constituents can also come in. In addition to all the organizations doing this work, the staffers that are giving them those briefings, um, constituents can actually make sure that these are the issues that stick at the forefront of their minds and are a priority. It is quite possible and highly likely that there are issues that they don't know a lot about, right? Realities that are lived by their constituents in their state or their district that they just aren't fully aware of or educated on. Um, and we, as constituents, 
um, sometimes feel that you know policy making is separate from us, and that that's part of what I love about this event and our our programs, um, you know, with young adults at FCNL is is really breaking that down to realize that's not true. It is not so separate from our work and our power. We have a role in that process. We, we need to embrace it, right? So telling our stories provide, um, or provides even more clarity and context for the decisions that members of Congress have to make. And sometimes you might actually be the first person to point the member towards a certain issue. I'm not sure that that will be the case here. I think this is an issue that uh, um, people at least know um, a little bit about. However, there are provisions. There are um, uh, provisions that we don't like and provisions that we do like, provisions that we want to see in legislation that they might not know about, right? Um, that happens. I have actually been in a lobby visit where the staffer told me I was the first person to bring a certain bill to their attention. He did not know what I was talking about, took a bunch of notes, and seemed very enthusiastic about following up with the member of Congress. Um, so I, I think that will hopefully uh, settle some nerves in here as well, if there are any, that you're not talking to an expert in pathways to citizenship, right? When you're talking to an office. You're talking to another person that is working on a lot of different issues and you are going to make sure this is their priority and they know what we want them to prioritize uh, specifically in terms of, of provisions. So, we know why stories are important, but maybe you're wondering what is a story? It might seem obvious, but you might also be thinking, I'm not sure that I have one, right? I think it's very easy to imagine a story being one of impact. I think that um, many of us assume, and I've experienced this in many of our conferences, in our trainings, that if something does not directly impact you, that for some reason that means you don't have a story. And that is absolutely not true. Your story is very simply an answer to the question of why. So why do you care about this issue? Obviously we're here because we're committed because we care, but why? Why are we committed to this issue? And the answer to that question might not come to you right away. So we're actually going to model a couple different types of stories um, so that you all can hear some examples but also uh, feel a little more supported in figuring out what is your story. And we will actually have time during this session to think about our own stories and, and talk them through a little bit. So I'm going to ask um, Destiny in one moment to share her story, but logistically, this happens in a lobby visit that, you know, might not be very long. We tell people that lobby visits might be 15 to 20 minutes. I have had people with much longer lobby visits. Uh, I'm not saying it's a guarantee it'll be that short, um, but uh, we want people to prepare for that. Um, my dad really likes to say, he says, oh, I would have made that shorter, but I didn't have time. Um, and I, I really like that little quote. I'm sure he didn't make it up. I'm sure he heard it somewhere. But uh, it is a lot easier to fill time with more stories, with more information, with more questions. It is a lot harder to realize, oh, it's 10 minutes into a 15-minute lobby visit and no one has told their stories yet for some reason. I don't know why that would happen, but it could. Um, so when you're telling a story, please make sure that you're keeping it within two minutes is the, generally what we tell people. Um, again, no one's going to be timing you. No one's you know, monitoring how the stories are going. But just keep that timing in mind when you're thinking about what you want to say in a visit, 
because there's more than the stories that happen in the visit, right? There's introductions. You have to say the ask more than once, we recommend. You want to ask questions of the office. You want them to tell you how they're feeling about what you're saying. And so to make time and room for all of that, we want to make sure our stories are short enough to, to leave that space. Um, so, okay, I will let you go ahead, Destiny, and, and share a, our first example. Well, hi again, everyone. I want to start by saying that I'm fighting for pathways for citizenship, uh, partly because one of my friends had dreams of becoming a doctor. So the entire year before, she spent the year volunteering at Esperanza Center in Baltimore City. Esperanza Center is a free clinic that offers medical and dental care. And every time I would visit my friend, the waiting room was overflowing and the staff was stretched thin. It was there that I saw firsthand that undocumented, undocumented immigrants are more likely to be uninsured. And so when you think of public programs such as Medicare, uh, the childhood um, immigration, the childhood um, healthcare program, uh, all of those are inaccessible to undocumented immigrants. And so no one should live in fear of seeking health coverage. And so that is why I am doing this work with you all. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Destiny's story. Um, we say that there are a couple different types of story, right? I just said impact is one that might come to mind right away. Um, but, but there are two others that we, we like to talk about. Um, and your story does not have to fit into any box, you know, any category. This is guidance. This is just to get your, get your gears moving, get your wheels turning, right? So, Destiny just told a story about value, right? Valuing access to medical care for everyone. Now that doesn't have to, that sentence that I just said, I didn't say undocumented immigrants, right? Um, but Destiny tied that value that she has into what she knows um, is the reality for undocumented immigrants being uh, the, the difficulty of accessing um, certain types of care, right? So for us, this is a story of either value or identity. We all have values in this room, right? Um, some very much shared values, which is why we're all here. And we all have various identities that um, impact our values and um, motivate what, what we advocate for. So you might care about this issue because of something like what Destiny just said. You might care about this issue because of your identity as a student, as a person of faith, as an educator, as a sibling. Um, so by leading with our values, we can actually find common ground through the humanity that we all share, right? So as a, as a faith-based organization, as a Quaker organization, FCNL, really um, at its core believes that there is that of God in every person. There is that inherent humanity, inherent dignity inside of every individual. And talking about values and um, sharing your values can kind of uh, cross a bridge in a way to help you find that common ground by uh, living in the humanity that you both do share, even though you might fully disagree on um, the, the specifics, right? So, so hopefully that, that, that can open a window for, for conversation. Um, and caring about an issue because of the values that you hold is a story. Your story is never wrong. If you're answering the question of why do you care, whatever comes to mind is correct because you care for reasons that we're not going to tell you, right? You all know. And so I think this is a great example of a story that isn't exactly about impact, but rather a value that destiny holds. And so you can all maybe think about it that way as one type of story, one, one trail, I guess, you can uh, follow in order to really um, figure, figure that story out. So um, I'm actually going to share a story now, and then Diana will also share a story. 
Um, so the story that I want to share, I will explain a little bit uh, afterwards kind of what, what, what the guide could be for this type of story. But let me, let me get into character. I'll just, I'm from Pennsylvania. I said I'll just pretend I'm lobbying um, Senator Toomey. So here we go. So I'm in a lobby visit. I'll say, hi, my name is Larissa, and I am so excited to be here. Um, I am from Pennsylvania. I've lived there since I was in second grade, and I'm part of Spring Lobby Weekend uh, that is happening this, this weekend. Actually, hundreds of us are coming together to advocate for a pathway to citizenship. And the reason that I care, when, when I think about why I care about a pathway to citizenship and why it's so important to me, um, I actually think about my childhood. I think about my upbringing. And I think about the fact that you know I did not become a citizen until I was a teenager. And while I was able to um, have that privilege while I was growing up, during the moments that I did not, I remember uh, meeting obstacles and being confused as well about those obstacles. I was trying to apply to scholarships or programs, right? I worked very hard in school. I was valedictorian. I really wanted to succeed academically and when I realized I would be barred from certain scholarships because I was not a citizen, I was really surprised. And so the reason I'm here is because that moment made me think of, or makes me think about the millions of undocumented immigrants that also do not have citizenship and are really great students um, or students who are working really hard and want to take advantage of certain opportunities and aren't able to because of their status. Um, and so I'm here to ask for this pathway to citizenship because I think about all of those um, undocumented students and, and I think about the opportunities that we all deserve access to. So, and scene. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I feel more comfortable saying, let's applaud for, for my co-host here, so thank you anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I also touched on some values, right? right? None of these are going to be perfect in each category, because they aren't real categories. Again, they are uh, guide guidelines, they are guide points, um, so that you can think about, about it. But um, in addition to value, what I really talked about was a turning point. So you can really discuss what was that turning point, that moment that you realized this is a problem and I care about this issue. Um, so you know, you heard me describe that moment where I did not have access to certain things, and now as an adult, I think back to that moment and realize it was a turning point in my motivation for, I would say, you know, general immigration reform, but specifically um, this issue around citizenship. And I did add a little bit more to my beginning, and I want to explain that. Not everyone needs to say their name, not everyone needs to say they're part of Spring Lobby Weekend. If you're telling your story, that's what we want, but we do encourage you to say your name. Uh, you're lobbying people that are, I guess, from the same state as you, so maybe say, um, hey, I'm also from the state I've lived there, I said I've lived there since second grade. Um, you know, uh, my, my supervisor really likes to say, you might even want to say what school you went to, because uh, they probably know, right, um, my hometown, for example, makes a certain type of candy that I think that I've actually entered Pennsylvania offices and seen that candy in their office. So that's something that I could laugh about, like, oh, that candy's factory is actually in my hometown. Like, you know, don't take up a bunch of time, but ground yourself in the fact that, hey, I'm here because you represent me. We're from the same um, state or district. And if you want to mention Spring Lobby Weekend, I think at least one person should to really be clear what you're a part of this weekend. Um, but remember that, that two minutes. So uh, two to three, I didn't exactly time myself. It doesn't have to be perfect. So um, you know, if that's going to take up too much time, then don't do that. But it, it, it is something that could add to your story. So um, I'll turn it now to Diana for our third example of a story. Alrighty, so I'm going to go into 
uh, theater mode as well. And so, <laughs> hello, my name is Diana Maldonado. I'm a recent grad of Northern New Mexico College. Go Eagles! <laughs> I currently live in Washington, D.C. I am a DACA recipient. However, my status is temporary and it is not enough, right? And so a pathway to citizenship would mean I, I'm sorry, a pathway to citizenship would mean a permanent solution and a deliberation for millions of people like myself who live with much fear and uncertainty every day. It would mean I could fully integrate into my daily life, plan ahead for my future, and have access to limited resources like education, healthcare. It would mean I can bloom without limits from the seeds my parents once planted when arriving to the United States. It would mean I can fully integrate into the communities that I was raised in and that I identify as my own home. A pathway to citizenship is critical, and our undocumented immigrants deserve to be honored and respected and recognized as the people that we are, Americans, individuals who work hard and contribute to this country, but most importantly, we are resilient, courageous human beings. Cut off. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. You got a lot of love over here. So. <laughs> I do want to emphasize that you know you you should only share what you feel comfortable with. Um, yeah, that's that's a big one. And you read my mind because that's literally the next thing I was gonna say. Um, I'll I'll just repeat what Diana said. You do not have to share anything that you don't want to. So that's another reason we have so many types of stories, right? because maybe the story that immediately comes to mind is something you do not want to share for whatever reason. Um, and that is not, you know, the point of storytelling is not to force you to say anything that you don't want to. You don't even actually have to share your story at all because, um, you know, you will be assigning roles. And so if you want to share, you can, you can volunteer to share at the lobby visit. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. And when you are sharing your story, like Diana said, really only what you're comfortable with. In addition to, you just heard Diana talk about the impact of this issue on her and her life. Impact doesn't have to be personal impact. It could also be community impact, someone in your family, one of your friends. But caution with that type of story. You should never reveal something or details of someone else's story without their explicit permission. Um, so if you're thinking of someone right now, you know, maybe tonight call them up and ask, have a conversation. Um, but again, there are many types uh, that you can, can work with, um, so you don't necessarily have to do that. But what I like to say is to always share ideas and not IDs. And I did not coin that. Um, I learned it from the wonderful organization Race Forward, if you all maybe want to check them out at some point. But I learned from them ideas, not IDs. Um, especially in an issue like this one, there might be sensitive information that you uh, do not want to reveal, or if you're talking about someone else, reveal something that will harm them in some way, right? So make sure that even if you do get permission from someone, you're not saying their name, uh, you're not saying where they live or anything, and this goes for any issue, not just the one that we're talking about right now. Uh, you know, these are types of stories that we give for any issue and advice and cautions that, that we give for any issue. So I want to thank the two of you for sharing your stories once again. And I'll actually hand it off now to Destiny to talk about, OK, well, if I have a story, where in the lobby visit does that even happen, right? What is the rest of the lobby visit? And Destiny will take us through that right now. Thanks, Larissa. So to start us off, before we get into it, I want you all to, you all got those beautiful bags. In that bag, you should have two things. There should be a lobby visit roadmap and the one pager on pathways to citizenship. So can you all take out the lobby visit roadmap? That's the most important thing here. And again, like we said at the previous session, if you don't have it, you lost it or something, uh, you can also find it on fcnl.org slash slwresources. 
do you have the roadmap? Yes, I do. Okay, well, great. Oh, do so you have it? Yeah, I have it. <laughs> yeah. So on the first page of the lobby visit roadmap, uh, you will see that there are room for you all to take notes. So to figure out the logistics of who's going to play which role in your visit. Now, this sheet is going to be super important for you to structure your visit. So please, please, please keep track of the sheet. Um, so I'm gonna go through the lobby visit roadmap. So there are two roles on that first page. And one is the group leader and the note taker. And we'll start with the note taker. The note taker is arguably probably the most important role uh, because it's really important that you all take thorough notes. Whoever is the note taker, you need to take thorough notes because that will be the information you use to fill out the report back form. The report back form is important to us because we will take all the information that you gathered in your congressional offices and it will help us to uh, take that information and to make our advocacy more effective as we plan for the future after this event. Now, shifting to the group leader. Um, the group leader is, they will facilitate the entire visit. Uh, so you will introduce your group. That's the time to say where you're from. You could say you're here for spring lobby weekend. And you'll also be really keeping track of the step-by-step -step, um, guide that you see in the back, making sure you guys are staying on task so that you'll all be um, practicing together tomorrow. Um, all of your in your state lobby groups and so the group leader is really just going to make sure that you're staying on track and so you get through everything that you all practice because we want to hear everyone's story we want to we want to make time make sure there's time for you all to introduce yourself so the group leader is really just keeping you all on schedule and organized now if you flip to that second page um, the second page is really FCNL, uh, FCNL's like sh recommended structure for your lobby visit. So you can really go down that list and it'll tell you everything that you should be doing in these visits. Now you'll also see that there are more roles outside of just the group leader and the note taker. There is room for two to three storytellers and that's why you all heard these stories today. So this is the time to start kind of brainstorming what would be your story if that was the role that you would play. Um, and then also in that, there's other roles such as um, giving, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. There are, you'll also be able to thank the um, congressional office as well, so that's a, a, another role. And we'll also, and so you'll also um, have, so can you pick? Oh yeah, yeah, no, you're good. So what Destiny is referring to is like, you do see a step-by-step, -step, right? And sometimes you see that it says delegation member, right? Mm -hmm. Delegation member is basically a cue for like another role. So like number one says, introduce yourself. So the first thing you're doing is an introduction. And the group leader is the person who introduces. But then the next thing also says group leader, how much time do you have? And then the third thing is that thank you. So I'm glad you pointed that out because that is like the first opportunity you have in a visit to outside of the group leader give a role. Um, some of you have visits that are like 25, 30 people, um, and we want as many opportunities for those people to speak as possible. And that's why um, each step you can almost see as a different role. Unless you see it says group leader, then that person should probably take it on. But you know, you introduce yourselves, the group leader can say, hey, we're a group from wherever, um, and we are here as part of Spring Lobby Weekend. Hundreds of us are advocating for a pathway to citizenship. The second thing you do is ask how much time there is left. Because um, while this is the beginning of the visit, things happen, schedules change, outside of offices in our own lives, things change. And they might not have as much time as they, they said originally. So it's always good after you've introduced yourself to ask how much time there is left. And once the, or how much time that person has. Once the group leader is done, then other members can really jump in with steps, um, if you're looking at it, three 
through five. So Destiny, do you wanna go over like what are steps three through five? And then we can like pause before we get to that Q and A. It's a little less structured once you once you get to step six in the roadmap. Yes. So for step three, you all are going that's the time to thank your congressional office. Uh, so whoever is the assigned group leader, they're going to thank the office for inviting them into the space and then um, and, and it can be simple. You don't have to like kind of give a whole spiel, but it's just really important that you thank them for their time. And then for step four, that is when the group leader will introduce the ask. And so you can look at that one pager um, that is in your packet to help you kind of figure out how you'll bring the ask. And then for step five, um, that was the time where those two to three people that you assigned to be your storytellers, that is where you'll explain why you care about the issue. Um, so this is that space to think about that. Yeah, so when you're in a lobby visit, you're telling stories after you've gotten through that kind of intro portion, then you say the ask, that one sentence that we practice and we will practice again, um, and then you dive into your stories. Um, it is after the stories that the conversation opens up to the legislative office. So up until this point, your delegation is speaking. Um, and the staff member, besides saying thank you or you know, acknowledging something you said, is probably just listening, right? Introduced yourself, you told your stories, and now is when you want to hear from them. Basically, what do you think about what we're saying? But we gave you very specific questions that Anika highlighted and previewed in our previous session that we want all of you to ask. So in step six, you see that after you've gone through your stories, you will say, does the member of Congress support establishing a process for undocumented immigrants to apply for permanent status in the US? You could literally read it from this roadmap. If you wanted to, you could write it down. Um, no one will uh, think less of the group or the lobby visit if you have papers or things you're looking at. Totally fine. We all have notes. Um, and depending on what they say, if they say, yes, we are supportive, that sounds great, then that follow-up question you see is, will you publicly emphasize the need for a path to citizenship? And if they say no, we do not support a pathway to citizenship. You're obviously not going to ask them to make a public statement about that. Um, we don't want uh, negative uh, dialogue to be added to what we want to be a very positive dialogue around this issue. Um, so instead, you're going to ask them, in what ways do you oppose a pathway to citizenship? basically getting at the core of why they are opposed. And, and they'll tell you. They'll say what it is about the, the legislation that we want that they will not agree with. And you have those four provisions um, in your leave behind that you can really point to, you know, depending on if, if, if they need a little push, you can say, well, these are the provisions we want. Um, which ones sound good to you? Which ones do you support? Which ones do you not support? And you can see that there, what elements of the legislation we outline in the leave behind will you support? So they might not support all four in one bill, but um, I have found it rare that someone says, we don't support literally anything you're saying. There's usually at least one provision that you can kind of find some common ground on. Um, then you're repeating the ask. So this can be yet another person. Repeat the ask, that one sentence. You say it at the beginning, you say it at the end. Then you thank them again, thank you for your time, and you make sure that you know how to follow up with that office. Um, follow up is really important. Like Destiny said, I'm so glad that you did. Note taker is really important, the most important role, because if we don't get that report back, if no one follows up with the office, then the lobby visit still happened, and hopefully that influence will, will be there. But we will not be able, as a team, to uh, be as effective as we can be in our, in our advocacy, um, because there might be information that one of you gets from these offices that if you don't put it in a report back, we're not going to know. And, and we want to know, and I know Diana and Anika uh, definitely need this information. I like to say that. The constituents around the country and our policy teams at FCNL are one team. 
And so while Diana and Anika are giving us information that we need, we give them information that they need as well. So we're working together, right? Um, now, the good thing about this roadmap is that it is literally a step-by-step -step guide. And tomorrow, when we have our two-hour training, you'll go through the roadmap with very skilled trainers um, from our staff who will explain, uh, you know, once again, going through the roadmap, but more importantly, assign those roles so everyone knows what they're saying. And then you'll actually get to practice. So um, hopefully this roadmap will be very helpful. And I just want to re-emphasize those questions in the middle, step six, um, because that really gets at the information that we need from those offices. Um, am I missing anything? Destiny, can you think of anything about the roadmap that, that we haven't said already? Um, no, I think I, keep this with you and use it as your guide, but really the stories are is going to be the most important thing and make sure that they're authentic to to you and that you, you can easily express it when you're in the room. Um, so yeah. start thinking about that. Yeah. And in addition to your story, actually, I did think of something while I was asking you. So while we are thanking the office for their time, and that's important, we also, um, in that thank you step, step three, if you're still looking at the roadmap, um, again, you've introduced yourself, you've asked how much time there is in the visit, and then you're thanking them for their time. But even more than that, you want to thank them for something that they've done. Maybe they are already very supportive of the issue. You can thank them for that. Maybe you know that they have signed on to a bill or voted yes on a bill that has nothing to do with a pathway to citizenship but was very important to you and your group. You can thank them for that too. They're working on lots of issues, so your thank you doesn't necessarily have to be about a pathway to citizenship. It could be about something else that they've worked on. Um, and then, again, you introduce the ask and, and you dive into your story. So I feel like we could repeat the step-by-step -step many, many times, but uh, I hope that this was clear. And like Destiny said, we want you to hold on to this. You'll hear an example tomorrow. You heard some stories today. You'll hear what a lobby visit sounds like tomorrow. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it on paper. It's another thing to hear it. And then you'll all actually get to go through the roadmap with your trainers and assign the roles that you all need in your groups. So what we're going to do now is transition to a bit of an activity. So um, stories might not come to us right away, right? Uh, we might need some time to reflect and think about what our story would be, and that's perfectly fine. Our visits for a lot of us aren't until Tuesday. Um, but right now we want to take the opportunity to actually think through and talk through our stories. So um, those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you are very fortunate to have Sarah again with you, and Sarah will actually help you go through your own stories and give you that opportunity in some breakout rooms to talk about your stories. In this room, in the ballroom, I'd like you to turn to the person either next to you or behind you or in front of you. Doesn't matter. Wait, not yet. Wait, not yet. Wait, not yet. I hear people talking. Wait. And please talk about your story. So think about why do I care about a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants? Does not have to be perfect. You're not telling the story uh, necessarily right now, but you're, you're working through it. So talk to your partner, and we will um, stay in this room and talk to your partner. We're going to stay up here on the stage. And then we will ask if anyone wants to share out in about 15 minutes. So please stay, talk to a partner, think about your story, and then we'll see if anyone wants to share anything out. And Sarah, good luck with uh, the, the, the workshop online. Good luck, Zoom audience. Thank you. Oh, wow. I hope those conversations were um, fruitful. I hope they felt meaningful. I hope you feel better about what you're going to say. Um, and I hope maybe you even learned something from the person that you spoke with. So I'm going to actually hand it off to Destiny to get some of you to share what you discussed um, does not have to be the perfect pitch 
two minute story, um, but you know, this practice, practice is good. So hopefully um, you all can, can take this opportunity to talk through your story even more. Go ahead, Destiny. Okay, it's time for a little bit of share back. Who feels like they want to share? Let's start with you. Hello everyone, my name is Courtney and I'm from Michigan, but I attend school in North Carolina at North Carolina a and State University. Um, and for my story, I would say, I remember in sixth grade, we had a quote unquote graduation going into middle school. And I remember I had a best friend who, when the graduation came, everyone had all their family and friends come, like everyone had a bulk of family come for this big celebration. And I remember seeing that she only had less than a handful of family come. And I remember asking her, where's your family? Like, why isn't your family here to support you? You know, everyone has family here. And being like sixth grade, I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not sure why. And I remember her telling me, oh, they can't come. Like, they can't come. And I was like, well, why? They don't want to support you? And she's like, no, they're just, they can't. Like, they're scared and they can't come. And then I remember when I got home and I asked my parents, I was like, dad, she didn't have any family come. And I remember him telling me, sometimes different families have different obstacles and that doesn't allow them to be at big celebrations or be at big public events because they're, they have a fear of the unknown. And I remember asking, what is this unknown? And he was like, well, my dad, he was like, well, that unknown could be anything. That unknown could be a stop in the car from a police officer. It could be just saying the wrong thing. It could be just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I remember thinking back to at my school, a lot of times the students would make a lot of jokes about um, negative connotations of undocumented immigrants. And I, I remember just kind of leaning towards that. And then I don't think it was later on until I later got invited to a quinceanera where I actually got to meet this family of hers. And all these negative connotations went straight out the window because these are people just like me just like my family, hardworking, loving, and very supportive of her because they showed up when they could. And I remember thinking back to sometimes people are afraid of the fear of the unknown just because they have different circumstances than me and other families. And I feel like that's what I would share. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to go next? Can we bring the mic over here? All right. What? Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm Ling, L I N G, uh, L I N H. So yeah, I'm an international student from Vietnam, and yeah, I came from the Bowling Green State University in Ohio. So my story is gonna be pretty short. When I was accepted to BGSU, I probably need to get a visa to get to the US, right? And the very first thing that people like remind me to like talk with the interview about like the visa and stuff is to emphasize that you're not gonna stay in here. You gonna get a non-immigrant visa and you're gonna leave whenever you're done studying and with your education. You're not supposed to stay here. And you have to emphasize it or else you will be rejected with the visa. Yep. And I'm being a documented person now. My status on the document is an alien, of course, and that's when I'm going with the legal way. If you're thinking about undocumented immigrants, they don't have that right. They just simply couldn't because they don't have the documentation. 
they couldn't really make sense of what they being here and with like the current law they just something to be deal with not human beings so yeah that's just my story that was really powerful thank you for sharing anyone else okay can we bring the mic over here Hello everyone, <clears throat> my name is Ramtin Farasat, I'm from Texas. Um, <laughs> I got a native Texan shirt on under this uh, hoodie. Um, so, with, for my story, I used to go to Iran every year for five weeks to visit my family. Okay. And, you know, the whole society was kind of like humanized to me because I was such a young child and I was exposed to it. Sometime about when I was 16 years old, I have some cousins who are about 10 years older than me, and we were driving on the highway. Something to note here is that Persian culture, kind of similar to Hispanic culture, is like very like macho-y, and my cousins fit into that stereotype like to a T. And to see um, this happen was kind of shocking to me, but we were driving down the highway, there were six of us in a five-seater car, and um, music was blasting, some of us were smoking cigarettes, they were joking and laughing, and we drove past um, Evan Prison. Um, to those of you who don't know, it is a political prison that is located in a mountain uh, in Tehran. Oh. And as we passed Evan Prison, they turned the radio off. They stopped laughing and joking. They put out their cigarettes. Complete silence in the car. It was very stark change. It happened really suddenly. And at first I remember being really confused. And then it kind of dawned on me that they probably know people who are in that prison currently, who are also currently probably being tortured in that prison. And it was kind of like their moment of silence. And they live with that fear every single day. And um, that has robbed them of their hope, which with no hope, I believe um, your humanity slowly decays. And this is the kind of fear that undocumented immigrants in this country are trying to flee, right? They're trying to get away from that. And this country, when it was founded, was supposed to be a beacon of hope exactly for those people. Somewhere along the way, we have lost that. And we must return to that. And that's why I believe that we have to have a swift pathway to citizenship for folks who are fleeing persecution and violence in their home countries. Thank you. Thank you. These are some wonderful stories. Yeah. But now we're going to shift to our audience at home, and we'd love to hear from one of you a story. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK, so we have two stories from our virtual audience, the first by Sandra Avalos and the second by Lillian Duma. So Sandra, I'll turn it to you first. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. This is Sandra Avalos from Dallas, Texas. Um, unfortunately, our flight was delayed. Woo! Our flight was delayed and we weren't going to be able to make it uh, until probably Monday. But definitely happy to share. Este, I am originally from Michoacán, Mexico. Este, uh, my family migrated in 1996. Um, this is dear to my heart because I have been doing advocacy work in immigration um, for almost five years now. And in the process, I have learned of folks um, that are like myself, that are documented, but also folks that have been left out of DACA, out of DACA um, for various reasons. And also in the process, other folks um, that have shown me that um, when we're talking about migration, we're not just talking about Latinos, but we're also talking about um, Black folks, um, Asian folks, and um, Middle Eastern. And so I wanted to highlight that because I know sometimes we forget about those folks too, and sometimes we're done not represented in some of the spaces that we're in. Um, 
este, so going back to why part of what I do, it's because storytelling is because I truly believe that that's the way that we take our power back. I know when I started in the movement, um, we were, since growing up, we were told to, you know, stay quiet, don't draw attention to yourself, you know, basically stay in the shadows. But by telling our stories, we take that power back. And so to me, this is why it's very important. Um, it's the, so um, I do it for my community, for my family, um, for folks that are like my mom, that unfortunately doesn't have a status in this country, that some of the bills that we have in place, unfortunately, will not protect my mom. So it's very important to me that we also remember folks like that. Um, and folks that have been deported and are still back in the home countries where they have been deported to, like my dad. Um, so with that being said, this is Sandra Avalos. I, this is my second year that I have done um, it's the Spring Lobby Weekend, and I'm very excited to be part of this. And along with me, I have a couple of my students, um, a couple of my community folks, and folks from uh, one of the universities, lovely SMU. So thank you for um, having us. Hi, um, my name is Lillian Duma. I'm also part of the Dallas group. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm a student right now at Southern Methodist University in Dallas as well. And my family, my why to why we should get um, a concrete like path to citizenship is because my family, though they're now citizens at this point in time, they immigrated in 1999 from Albania, which at the moment was a post-communist, like fallen government, civil war type country. And they fled um, for their lives, for a better life for their children. And um, even though I was born just like a year after my parents came to the U.S., um, they, since having come for a better life, they didn't really, they didn't really get their citizenship till 13 to about 17 years after coming to the U.S. And their path to immigrate, their path to citizenship was just super hard given that they came with like probably $500 to their name to the U.S. Um, and they came without family. And so without having a concrete path to citizenship, a lot of immigrants cannot see their families abroad and they didn't know when they were going to see their mom, their dad, or my grandparents, their siblings ever again, which made the process of just adjusting to a new country so, so hard. Um, and it made it a lot, much more miserable, honestly, just trying to make a best, the best life out of yourself without being able to see your family for 15, 20 years. Um, and so having a concrete path to citizenship would give people, I would say hope, honestly, and seeing an end, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of when they can finally reap all the full privileges of being a citizen, you know, even though they're all humans or likewise two citizens, you know, if not. Um, so that's why I'm here on this trip, but also why I believe that we should have concrete legislation. Thank you. Do we have time for more stories? Okay. okay, I think we have time for about one more story. Anyone? Okay, can we bring the, okay. Uh, okay. Hi, my name is uh, Monse. I'm currently a DACA recipient, essential worker in the agriculture work of uh, the Salad Bowl, Salinas, California. <laughs> And most importantly, I want to tap in on the people who don't want to show their face, who don't want to tell their story, people I work with every day who are in charge of making sure we all have food in our table. During pandemic, doesn't matter your color, your religion, people who are there. And we are actually struggling right now to keep those people employed because of the uh, um, e verify and everything that's going on. People don't want to work. And the people that do want to work, they don't want to let them in. It's not adding up. I also think uh, universal immigration reform will finally unite our immigrant community. Me as a dreamer myself, I've been bashed by my own community because they tell me, well, you have DACA, I have nothing. Congress planted 
a seed of poison in our community. And the only way we can attack that is replicating environments like this, where color, race, standards, it doesn't matter. We're all coming together for one cause, and that is an universal immigration reform, despite of where we come from or what we have experienced. And this is why I'm here. I went back to Mexico a month ago because I lost someone. Even with DACA, I was too late to say goodbye to the person that raised me, but I'm here because no one should go through that. Thank you to everyone who shared their story today. You guys are going to be brilliant in your lobby visits, and I can't wait to hear all the stories when you guys get back. Yay! All right, so I will just um, also say thank you to everyone who shared their stories on Zoom in the ballroom. And before we transition to what is in the schedule as unprogrammed worship, we're going to have um, our wonderful Bobby Trice come up here in a moment and you know, set us up for that and explain, in case you don't know what that is, um, what it is. So before I do that, I want to make a couple announcements. So first of all, a correction. I said something that was not correct. Um, so I said there are office hours tonight. That is true. There are virtual office hours at 6 o'clock with Anika and Sarah. Um, there will not be in-person office hours until tomorrow. So that is in your program. At 4 o'clock, there are office hours for those of you who are here in person. Um, you can ask questions at 6 o'clock today. I just uh, said that there were also some in-person hours today, and that is not true. It is only virtual at 6 o'clock. The link is at fcnl.org slash slw. Make sure you're clicking on the schedule and uh, you'll see how to um, actually join and, and get all of your questions hopefully answered. So first, correction. The second thing I wanna say is a reminder that um, Daylight Savings is happening tonight. <laughs> and um, I don't know if all of you, I, okay, it seems like no one is happy about that. <laughs> um, so I don't want to mess this up. I'll just uh, say what I have written. This means that we are moving ahead one hour. So when it becomes 2 AM, it's actually 3 AM is what that means. I'm very bad at daylight savings and remembering which one is which. So being very explicit there that um, we are losing an hour um, tonight while you're hopefully sleeping. But that's just so you know to keep that in mind when you show up tomorrow. Um, iPhones and, and other devices uh, change those things automatically, but it is helpful to know just in case. All right, great. The last thing, um, second to last thing I'll say is that there is going to be a walk to the White House at 445. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. At 445 PM. Um, it is not nice out, <laughs> so if you brought an appropriate jacket and you're feeling like you will be warm enough to make it there, please, we're still going to go. Um, I think it'll be fun to walk over there and, and get some pictures. We will also do it tomorrow because the weather is not great today. Uh, that way, if you're like, absolutely not, it's too cold, we will be going tomorrow. Um, but hopefully some of you will join us today anyway. So today and tomorrow, today at 445, and tomorrow when the program ends at 5 o'clock, we'll be walking over to the White House. Um, and then the last thing I'll say um, is that I want to remind everyone about the birds of a feather groups. So remember that at registration, we are going to, or we have some sheets that you can actually sign up to create these different groups for lunch tomorrow. So what that means, like I said earlier, is that if you 
want to meet with people that share an identity with you or share an interest with you, you can go sign up at the table, you can recommend groups that we don't already have written down, and we'll make those decisions tonight, figure out, okay, which groups uh, will we actually be able to put together for lunch tomorrow. Um, I think that's it, those are all okay. the announcements. Okay, so I'm going to ask everyone to sit tight, please, um, and Bobby is gonna come up and just set up the space and then give a quick explanation of what we're doing. We'll end at 4.45 and we'll head over to the White House for those of you who want to join. Like I said, I want to be very clear. I hear a little bit of chatter. If you need to exit the room during worship, it is silent worship. So you need to do it very, very quietly to be respectful of the space. Um, it is half an hour until 4.45. Um, so please sit tight and I'll let Bobby come up here. And do you want to say something now, or should we give it three minutes? Three minutes? Okay, great. Okay, thanks, everybody.